The pericardium is a sac that covers the heart and the roots of the great vessels. The pericardium has two layers, an inner serous layer and an outer fibrous layer, and the space between the two layers is the pericardial cavity. The pericardial cavity is normally filled with about 50 milliliters of serous fluid that cushions the heart from any kind of external jerk or shock, like a shock absorber. The pericardium also fixes the heart to the mediastinum to prevent it from twisting so that the big vessels don't get pinched shut. Pericardial disease is inflammation of the pericardium due to a variety of causes, from infections to autoimmune disorders, cancer, and trauma. In pericarditis, the pericardium is inflamed and irritated. If the inflammation leads to the accumulation of excess fluid in the pericardial sac, then it's called a pericardial effusion, and in its worst form, that extra fluid can cause tamponade physiology. Finally, there's constrictive pericarditis, which is where the inflammation is chronic and leads to fibrosis. In pericarditis, the two inflamed layers of the pericardium rub against one another every time the heart beats. This causes severe, sharp, retrosternal chest pain that radiates to the neck, shoulders, and back, and it typically happens with each breath during inspiration. That's because in inspiration, the lungs expand, filling the thoracic cavity and compressing the pericardium. The pain typically worsens when a person is supine and improves when a person is sitting upright and leaning forward. Upon auscultation, there's a pericardial friction rub, which is a scratchy, grating, high-pitched rub resembling the sound of leather on leather rubbing against each other. On ECG, there's widespread ST segment elevations in several leads, which distinguishes it from the ST elevation in myocardial infarction, which is only present in the leads that correspond to the infarcted tissue. Also, a very specific ECG finding in pericarditis is PR segment depression. Pericarditis also causes generalized inflammation, so there's often an elevated white blood cell count, ESR, and CRP. In addition, it's important to obtain troponins to rule out conditions like a myocardial infarction. Since pericarditis can lead to pericardial effusion, a transthoracic echocardiography is used to look for a pericardial effusion. In addition, it can be used to look for wall motion abnormalities, which are widespread in acute pericarditis, but limited to the area of infarct in a myocardial infarction. Diagnosis of acute pericarditis is based on having the typical chest pain a friction rub on auscultation, suggestive ECG findings, and evidence of a pericardial effusion. Most cases of acute pericarditis are uncomplicated and self-limited, and most of the time there's no clear cause identified, or it's thought to be viral pericarditis, like from Coxsackie virus, and supportive treatment is given to ease the pain and inflammation. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, like ibuprofen or aspirin, usually work for pain relief. If NSAIDs aren't enough, they can be combined with colchicine, which inhibits neutrophil motility and has an anti-inflammatory effect. In some cases of acute pericarditis, corticosteroids may be used to calm the inflammation, but the use of corticosteroids is a risk factor for recurrence, so they should only be used if NSAIDs and colchicine aren't sufficient. Finally, if there's an underlying cause for the pericarditis, then it should be treated. For example, if there's a cancer of a surrounding tissue or organ, like a lymphoma, lung, breast, or esophageal tumor, then in some cases, chemotherapy can be injected directly into the pericardial sac. Similarly, if the underlying cause is a bacterial or tuberculosis infection, then antibiotics can help treat the pericarditis. In a pericardial effusion, the pericardial sac can fill up with up to 200 milliliters of fluid acutely and over a liter of fluid if it accumulates slowly. Small effusions can be asymptomatic unless they're associated with pericarditis, whereas a large effusion can cause symptoms of cardiac tamponade. That's where the fluid around the heart prevents the ventricle from relaxing enough to accept blood, which lowers cardiac output and causes hemodynamic compromise which can ultimately lead to shock. But timing matters, and if the effusion occurs rapidly enough, then even 100 milliliters can cause cardiac tamponade. 
Cardiac tamponade is life-threatening and causes Beck's triad, which is hypotension due to the impaired cardiac output, jugular venous distension due to blood backing up, and muffled heart sounds on auscultation because of the extra fluid between the heart and the stethoscope. In fact, larger effusions can cause Ewart's sign, which is dullness to percussion over the last subscapular area due to compression of the left lung base. On ECG, a large effusion can cause low voltages across many of the leads due to the increased distance from the chest leads. It can also cause electrical alternons, which is where the readings shift from heartbeat to heartbeat due to the heart jiggling around a bit with the effusion. And in cardiac tamponade, classic ECG findings include sinus tachycardia and a low QRS complex voltage. On an X-ray of a heart with a large pericardial effusion, you can see a silhouette that pools to the bottom of the heart and gives a classic water bottle sign, and a large pericardial effusion of at least 200 milliliters causes cardiomegaly. That's a large cardiac shadow that blurs out the distinction between the arch of the aorta and the left ventricle. Echocardiography is the main diagnostic tool used in the evaluation of pericardial effusion showing the excess fluid creating an echo-free space between the two pericardial layers. Echocardiography gives a very clear picture also on the extent of the effusion, which is directly proportional to the separation between the layers. The effusion can be small, moderate, or large. For circumferential pericardial effusions, a pericardial effusion that has less than 10 millimeters of pericardial separation in diastole is small, and corresponds to a fluid volume of 50 to 100 milliliters. 10 to 20 millimeters of separation is moderate and corresponds to a fluid volume of 100 to 500 milliliters. And greater than 20 millimeters separation is large and corresponds to a fluid volume greater than 500 milliliters. Additionally, on an echocardiogram, a pericardial effusion makes the heart look like it's dancing within the pericardium. In case of cardiac tamponade, echocardiography often shows collapsed ventricles. During inspiration, the negative pressure in the thoracic cavity leads to increased pressure into the right ventricle, which causes the interventricular septum to bulge toward the left ventricle, leading to decreased filling of the left ventricle. At the same time, the right ventricle volume is markedly diminished and sometimes its free wall can collapse. Finally, cardiac catheterization measures the pressure inside the cardiac chambers, and in the case of tamponade, the pressure in all four chambers is equal. If the cause of the pericardial effusion is unclear, pericardiocentesis can be done to obtain and analyze the pericardial fluid. If the fluid looks bloody or hemorrhagic, with a red blood cell count above 100,000 mm cubed, it's suggested of trauma, malignancy, or pulmonary embolism. If the fluid is chylous, then it suggests there's been an injury to the thoracic duct, often accidental trauma during surgery, or due to leukemic infiltration, where leukemic cells fill up the pericardial sac. Finally, if the fluid is purulent, then it should be sent for a white blood cell count, gram stain, culture, cytology, and a determination of glucose, protein, and LDH levels. An elevated white blood cell count may be present with both inflammatory and infectious causes. An elevated protein level higher than 6 grams per deciliter and a glucose level below 60 milligrams per deciliter suggest an infectious cause like a bacterial or tuberculosis infection, or an inflammatory cause like an autoimmune process or malignancy. An isolated increased fluid LDH level above 300 units per deciliter with a normal serum LDH level, suggests a malignancy. In terms of treatment, some pericardial effusions are small and naturally get resorbed by themselves over time. Pericardial effusions that are larger than 20 millimeters and persist for more than a month may be drained. In individuals with recurrent small pericardial effusions who don't have symptoms and don't have evidence for hemodynamic compromise, Regular follow-up with echocardiography is recommended. Any individuals that develop cardiac tamponade require emergency pericardial drainage by pericardiocentesis. That's where a needle is inserted laterally through the fifth intercostal space into the pericardial space 
and fluid is aspirated with ultrasound guidance. A drainage tube is often left in place if reaccumulation of fluid is likely. In some cases, drainage might require surgically cutting through the pericardium to create a pericardial window, so the fluid can leak out. In hypotensive patients, volume expansion with intravenous fluids and blood products may also be needed. Finally, there's constrictive pericarditis, which is a chronic process that results in fibrinous scarring and calcification of the pericardium. The pericardium becomes a rigid box that forms a non-compliant shell around the heart, limiting the heart's ability to expand and function normally. So when blood enters the heart, the walls of the heart relax back into this rigid box, creating the so-called pericardial knock during diastole on auscultation, which is due to the sudden termination of ventricular inflow by the encasing pericardium. There are no specific electrocardiographic findings in constrictive pericarditis. Non-specific ST and T-wave changes and tachycardia are common, and low voltage may also sometimes be present. Advanced cases may also develop atrial fibrillation due to stretching of the atrial walls due to increased atrial pressures. Two-dimensional echocardiography may also show a thickened pericardium, abrupt cessation of left ventricular and right ventricular diastolic filling, biatrial enlargement, and an interventricular septal shift with flattening and left-sided deviation of the interventricular septum. That, in turn, causes a decreased volume in the left ventricle. Also, there's excessive variations in transmetral, transtricuspid, pulmonary venous, and hepatic venous blood flow due to respirations. Doppler echocardiography shows an abnormally rapid early diastolic filling associated with a small ventricular volume. Cardiac magnetic resonance is sometimes done to help differentiate a small pericardial effusion from pericardial thickening. In the majority of cases, constrictive pericarditis is permanent and often progressive. The only definitive treatment option is pericardiectomy, or pericardial stripping, which is a surgical procedure where the entire pericardium is peeled away from the heart and removed. All right, as a quick recap, in acute pericarditis, there's widespread inflammation of the pericardium, which causes an elevated white blood cell count, ESR, and CRP. On ECG, there's widespread ST segment elevation in several leads, as well as PR segment depression. The treatment is usually anti-inflammatory medications like NSAIDs, and it can be combined with colchicine. If there's fluid accumulation in the pericardial sac, you get a pericardial effusion, filling with up to 200 milliliters of fluid acutely, and over a liter of fluid if it accumulates slowly. Small effusions can be asymptomatic unless they're associated with pericarditis, whereas a large effusion may cause symptoms of cardiac tamponade. Some pericardial effusions remain small and never need treatment. Individuals that develop cardiac tamponade require immediate hospital admission and prompt pericardial drainage by pericardiocentesis and potentially volume expansion. And finally, there's constrictive pericarditis, which results in fibrinous scarring and calcification of the pericardium, limiting the heart's ability to expand and function normally. The definitive treatment is pericardiectomy or pericardial stripping.